Thank you, Mr. President. I thank those members who have made a contribution uh, this evening to this bill and for their thought and consideration into their positions. Uh, the Honourable Ian Hunter, the Honourable Irene Nev Matikos, the Honourable Mark Parnell, the Honourable Connie Benaris, the Honourable Kay Scriven, the Honourable Dennis Hood, the Honourable Nicola Centafanti, the Honourable Stephen Wade, Minister for Health and Wellbeing, and the Honourable Rob Lucas, the Treasurer and Leader of the Government in this place. It's fair to say there's a variety of opinions in this room. It's fair to say that everyone has given this some thought before we come to this debate uh, before us. In summing up, I will note um, that uh, we have a bill before us that actually reflects the recommendations of the salary report. That report, which is uh, a reasonably heavy time uh, of October 2019, which was an extensive uh, piece of work, and I'll draw members' uh, attention to part 18, safe access zones. Recommendation 49, salary recommends that any new law in South Australia should include safe access zone provisions around premises where abortion services are provided. And the, the purpose of these provisions is to protect the safety and welfare and respect the privacy and dignity of people accessing the service and employees or other persons who need to access those premises in the course of their duties or responsibilities. Recommendation 50. Salary recommends that any new law in South Australia should provide that a place will be within the safe access zone of premises at which the service of providing an abortion is ordinarily undertaken if it is in the premises or not more than the prescribed distance from an entrance to the premises. Recommendation 51. Salary recommends that any new law in South Australia should provide that the prescribed distance is 150 metres. Recommendation 52, salary recommends that any new law in South Australia should provide that the operation of the safe access zones is not limited to the hours of operation of the premises and should be 24 hours a day and seven days a week with no exceptions. Recommendation 53, salary recommends that safe access zones should be automatically established by legislation and not by ministerial decree. Recommendation 54, salary recommends that a new offence be established in South Australia. I repeat that, that a new offence be established in South Australia to provide that it is an offence to engage in prohibited conduct in the safe access zone for an abortion services premises. Harassment and prohibited conduct should be defined to mean intimidation, obstruction, impeding access, harassment or other conduct that relates to abortions or could be or re could reasonably be perceived as relating to abortions and would be visible or audible to another person entering, leaving or in the premises and would reason be reasonably likely to deter a person from entering or leaving or from requesting, undergoing, performing or assisting in the performance of an abortion. And indeed, Recommendation 55, salary recommends that a new offence should be established in South Australia to, to provide that it is an offence for a person to make, publish or distribute a restricted recording of another person without the other person's consent and without reasonable excuse. A restricted recording should be defined to mean an audio or visual recording of a person while the person is entering, leaving or in an abortion services premises and which contains information that identifies or is likely to lead to the identification of the person being recorded. And finally, recommendation 56, salary recommends that there should be a maximum penalty of one year's imprisonment and or an appropriate fine for each of the offences in recommendations 54 and 55 above. So far from this being a figment of my uh, imagination, um, this is indeed the recommendation of the South Australian Law Reform. Institute that was thoroughly researched and well tested and heard from all opinions on this matter. Indeed, I've not ever heard anyone say that Sauri's got it wrong on uh, a majority of uh, the recommendations that they put forward in government bills. It seems to only be when it's those conscience votes that somehow Sauri is not to be listened to or acknowledged. But I do acknowledge the extensive work of Sauri. Um, I obviously have put such a bill before this place before. Indeed, it's almost a year since this place, this council, passed a very similar bill that also, more than a year, thank you, Minister for Health and Wellbeing, more than a year 
since we passed in this council. Uh, such a safe access zone protection for those workers and patients either working in the provision of abortion health care or seeking medical treatment or those supporting them, their families, their friends, their loved ones, provide that 150 metres of respite from protest. Specifically, protest, because indeed this bill does not, like the Honourable Dennis Hood alluded to in the ACT bill, outlaw all protest. Indeed, it is very specific. Um, it is indeed that prohibited conduct, intimidation, obstruction, impeding access, harassment. That is what we are talking about here. This bill does not ban silent prayer. What it does ban is the ability for silent prayer to be used to intimidate, obstruct, impede or harass. That will be the test of this law. The idea that somehow this law is not necessary because there has been no prosecutions is an incredibly circular argument that I really do not understand. The thing is, we don't have a fit-for-purpose law currently. The council around the Woodville PAC has had to retrofit and use its bylaws to address a situation that cause, causes workplace stresses to those working in that healthcare centre that does indeed provide an ongoing annoyance and hindrance to the residents around that healthcare service, that indeed I can vouch for many people I know who have either been supporting somebody or seeking abortion health care from that service who have been harassed, who have felt that they were being shamed or watched or their dignity and privacy was being uh, offended. And in fact, it's often not the patient because certainly the patient's in no state usually to deal with those people who probably do mean no harm. But these people tell me, the patients, the supporters of the patients and the healthcare workers themselves, that that's not the way that they feel when they are watched, when they are impeded, when there is these protesters that we all agree do protest outside abortion health care services in South Australia, they feel that they need more protection than is currently afforded them. And given the amount of abortion stigma and shame that is put on particularly women in our society, why on earth would you think that they're going to come out and call for these laws to protect them? They simply have a difficult experience made far more difficult on that day by our failure as a parliament to do what every other state and territory, except for WA, has so far done and ensure safe access zones around abortion health care. And I note, in the last half an hour, the Western Australian Parliament has passed a safe access zone abortion health care bill through its lower house. So we could actually finally not be the last uh, uh, for such a reform, uh, but we'll see. Time will tell this evening whether, whether we get through this debate tonight. But I've got to say, uh, the idea that uh, this bill is unnecessary is a little disingenuous when we know that the salary report has recommended it, and yet nobody who got up and spoke saying that this bill was not necessary mentioned the salary report. Um, the idea that people do not feel threatened and intimidated and harassed uh, is certainly not that of my experience of those constituents I have spoken to, those workers in these healthcare services that I have spoken to, their professional associations, whether it's the AMA or the HSU or the ANMF and the like, or indeed the very patients themselves. And I am here to say that human rights are universal and indivisible. You cannot cherry pick them. So there are other rights at stake here when we debate this tonight. There is a right to health. There is a right to a safe workplace. There is a right to privacy. There is a right to that respect for their decision. And uh, while people have waxed lyrical about the right of freedom of speech 
the free speech rights that are apparently trampled upon by this bill, I will note that, that is also disingenuous. We don't get to say whatever we like whenever we want to. In this place, this is the home of democracy and freedom of speech. I am indeed afforded parliamentary privilege right now while I speak. I am also afforded the protection through the president from being harangued and harassed and intimidated and prevented from speaking when it is my turn. <laughs> I also note there are people in the gallery. Some would be supportive of this bill. Some would be opposed to this bill. They do not have the right right now to speak at the microphone as I am doing. And should they do so, they would be removed from this place. Yet are we saying that this very parliament has trampled and stifled and ended free speech in South Australia? No, we do not, because we balance the responsibilities of free speech with the rights of free speech and indeed respect for dignity and democracy. I will have more to say on uh, the amendments that have been put up in the committee stage. I am somewhat frustrated that the other place did not debate the bill that this council sent down to it, that we had to start all over again with the member for Hurdle Vale in a bill in the lower house to try and get it through. And uh, I watched the extraordinary lengths that people went to to stifle that debate, to limit the time that that bill was given, uh, to get to that very respect indeed for freedom of speech and the right in this place to have our views noted for the record with the very votes that we carry, which is a real privilege, I've got to say, in representing our constituencies. We will not all agree, but I do think that this place does respect our differences of opinion. But what I fear is that should we amend this bill tonight, we will see yet again the games of the lower house, of the other place, used to not ever see this bill see the light of day and become an act and be assented to. So I have every sympathy for the Honourable Dennis Hood's amendment, but I will not be supporting it tonight. I do, however, offer to the Honourable Den Dennis Hood two options. The first, I am happy to either move or support an amendment to the other bill that we would be debating tomorrow, the uh, uh, termination of pregnancy bill, to ensure that in that, in the review clause that already exists within that bill, that we also look at safe access zones. Should that bill not pass this council or parliament, I also say I will support or indeed sponsor a private member's bill to effect the same, and I would hope it would pass both, both of the uh, houses of this parliament with uh, rapid speed, because I think it would be in everyone's interest to see that review clause. I note, finally, this bill is on those salary recommendations, but those salary recommendations also drew from the extensive experience in Australia over well over a decade um, of laws that have been tested and tested in the High Court because people who chose to protest outside abortion health care in various other jurisdictions actually were prepared to cross state boundaries to go and do that, were prepared to get arrested, were prepared to get it tested in the High Court. And this bill is a very safe option because it actually is a bill that reflects legislation that has passed those very tests, those tests that have balanced things such as freedom of speech with the right to health care, with the right to a safe workplace and with the right uh, to have your privacy respected. Uh, I look forward to the committee stage, Mr President. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. Those for the questions say aye. Against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. Goodbye. Division required. Ring the bells.
Order, order, lock the doors. Order. Those members in favour of the motion should stand in their place and those opposed should remain seated. Uh, I appoint the Honourable Ms Franks, teller for the eyes, and the Honourable Ms Scriven, teller for the nose. There being 14 ayes and seven noes, uh, the bill will be read a second time. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the, the Health Care Act 2008. the committee that the bill has four clauses. Uh, the amendments to the bill, the proposed amendments to the bill appear at clause four. Uh, does any member have any contribution on clause one? Uh, the Honourable Ms Scriven. Uh, yes, thank you Mr President. Uh, now this is for the record so I'm not trying to draw it out and I'll, hopefully the Honourable Member will um, uh, just simply answer, answer the question quickly. It's simply so it's on the record. Um, could the uh, mover advise how many times there have been prosecutions in regard to the Pregnancy Advisory Centre for the behaviour that is apparently going to be fixed by this bill? No, Ms Franks. Um, well, this bill will create a new offence, and so there's been no prosecutions for an offence that doesn't yet exist, but I imagine there may well be people who seek to test it. However, I note that in the bill, you actually have to really push uh, to get to that point where you are charged with the offence, that threatening, intimidating, harassing and uh, impeding somebody's access or indeed uh, uh, other prohibited behaviours. And that the police, indeed, this, this idea that um, somehow this bill is uh, unusual because the police might ask you to move on um, if they suspect you're about to commit offence. Um, will actually allow the police that ability to manage this situation in a way that they have been seeking the powers to do, that the council has uh, had to create a, a very unwieldy and uh, not fit for purpose permit system to address. And so I suspect that uh, while there's been no offences at the moment because this offence, this fit for purpose offence that has been recommended by the SA Law Reform Institute uh, has not actually existed until this point, um, that uh, you know, the, the fact that it, there hasn't been anyone charged and found guilty um, of an offence or a prosecution that was successful is actually an, an indication that we do need this particular law uh, to address situations where there's been uh, those tensions, uh, those difficulties. Indeed, there has been uh, fracas and uh, uh, you know arguments and. Uh, 
melee and so on that uh, those supporting the patients and the patients themselves have found, uh, getting into arguments, heated arguments with the protesters and the like, where this will now provide the police the ability to be able to intervene, de-escalate the situation, ask those creating the offence to the patients or their supporters or the health workers to move out of the 150 metre safe access zone. And should they not comply with that police direction, then that is when this offence will take effect. And I should imagine that there will be those who come and seek to test it. And so potentially we will have a prosecution in the next year or so. Uh, thank you. I'm not sure if the uh, member misheard. My question was how many times there's been prosecutions in regards to the behaviour that this is allegedly uh, going to fix, not I didn't refer to any particular offence. Uh, the Honourable Tammy Franks. I did understand your question. This creates an offence that will actually be able to be uh, fit for purpose for this behaviour. Uh, thank you. I draw the member's attention to the Summary Offences Act, which defines offensive behaviour, disorderly or offensive behaviour, uh, to include threatening, abusive or insulting. How many attempted prosecutions have there been uh, in relation to the Pregnancy Advisory Centre at Woodville? The Honourable Franks. Um, those are not the subject of this bill. This bill creates a new offence. Um, if the honourable member wishes to talk about the Summary Offences Act or the Criminal Law Consolidation Act, the appropriate place would be when we debate bills with regards to that. And then it would be the Attorney General you might ask those questions to. Uh, the honourable Claire Scriven, and I'll come to the minister. Um, yes, it's a little uh, interesting, given the uh, the member was talking about other members being uh, disingenuous. So the simple question uh, is. In regards to the uh, attempted prosecutions at the Pregnancy Advisory Centre, uh, and that's why it's relevant to this bill, because this is the reason that the member is saying there's no fit for purpose um, offence currently in existence, and yet there appears to be one that talks about threatening, abusive, or insulting behaviour. How many attempted prosecutions have there been uh, for uh, the behaviour outside of the Pregnancy Advisory Centre? Uh, that is the question. Uh, the Honourable Tammy Franks. Uh, thank you, Chair. I don't have that information to hand, so if um, the mover would be convinced to change her vote, uh, should uh, I undertake to get that information to her by the third reading, uh, perhaps we could dig up the archives. But I'm pretty sure that actually, no matter what I say right now, it's not going to change your vote, Miss, the Honourable Miss Scriven. Uh, well, I've got. I, I did on. I, I'll, I'll go to the Honourable Miss Scriven for one more, and then I'll go to the. Oh, no, I'll go to the minister. Minister, yeah, on the um, on the assertion that uh, base <coughs> base criminal laws <coughs> and summary offences laws are sufficient to deal with this um, these sorts of issues, is the member able to advise whether any other states or territories have needed to have specific provisions in relation to uh, healthcare access uh, to protect access? Thomas Franks. Thank you, Chair. Uh, through you, Chair, every other state and territory of Australia, with the exception of WA, has a law fit to create a safe access zone outside abortion health care um, of up to 150 metres, as is in this legislation. Each and every one of those jurisdictions, because I note that in WA the health minister there has uh, introduced a bill that has now passed one chamber of that parliament. Every place in Australia has had, through either government legislation or private members' legislation, protections around abortion health care because they have all required it. And what I would note, and I raised this the last time, a year and a bit ago, uh, when we discussed this matter, if South Australia is the only jurisdiction in Australia that does not have this protection, those who seek to protest outside abortion health care will come to South Australia to protest outside the abortion health care services here. We know that from the High Court experience. We know that the people who seek to protest to stop abortions taking place in health care, lawful health care services in Australia will travel a very long way to do so. So South Australia, if it were to be the only jurisdiction not to have such a law, would indeed 
be the jurisdiction where all of those who sought to protest abortion would come. The Honourable Scriven. Uh, thank you. And uh, just I'd like to place on the record, uh, my understanding is there was one person who travelled uh, from Tasmania into another state. Uh, I believe it was Tasmania. However, um, my question is in regards to the member's frequent uh, reference to the salary report. Um, from my reading of that report, I cannot see uh, any reference to uh, the, um, the authors of the report and those who were involved in that investigation in uh, actually attempting to, uh, to talk with women who had been offered and received assistance from people outside of the abortion centres, such as a number of women who are mentioned in my second reading contribution. Uh, can, the men, uh, can the member tell me whether there's something that I've missed in that report in regards to reaching out to those women to find out the assistance they received and how they would be affected if this law was, if this bill was to proceed. Uh, the Honourable Tony Frank. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I would actually note that despite what the Honourable Claire Scriven just informed the Council that both of the High Court challenges that tested the very laws that we are now basing our uh, bill that we are currently discussing on, uh, but in both of those situations, people travelled over state borders to protest in those two jurisdictions. So there's at least, well, you only said one, so there's more than one. Oh, they moved to the state. Okay, order. even better. No, no, order, order. We're not having a conversation here. The Honourable Tammy Franks, order. Okay, order. so. Thank you, Chair. Um, Order. The Honourable Tammy Franks is the call. We will not have a conversation across the benches. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think the Honourable uh, Claire Scriven asked me to explain to her uh, a document that she read from from the Castan uh, Human Rights uh, Law Centre for Human Rights Law. I didn't refer to that document. She did, and if she doesn't comprehend it, that that's her concern, and it's nothing to do with this particular um, uh, discussion that we're having about this at Clause 1. I don't understand why I'm ask, being asked about a document by the uh, Monash Law, Monash University's Castan Centre for Human Rights Law and what it might mean. Oh. oh, the salary report. You'll have to be a bit clearer when you say which report, because I couldn't tell which one you were referring to. So could you ask the question again if you were referring to the salary report? Certainly. What well, indications are there from the salary report that they reached out to, to women such as those who had received assistance outside of abortion centres? Uh, and I referred to some of the examples that I used in my second reading contribution uh, as an example of those women who have found it most beneficial to have that assistance offered outside of abortion clinics. Thomas Franks. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the clarification because I did not hear which report you were referring to in your original question. Um, the salary uh, consultation was actually an open process available to all people, not just in South Australia, indeed Australia and the world. Um, everyone was able to make a submission to it. Uh, the Honourable Ms Scriven. Thank you, Mr uh, Chairman. Um, yes, being able to make, being, being open to everyone is quite different to actually seeking out the experiences of people who have benefited. So I think I'll just uh, leave that on the record. Thank you. If there are no further contributions at Clause 1, I intend to put the question that Clause 1 stand as printed. Uh, I'm, I'm about to put the question that Clause 1 stand as printed. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Are there any contributions on clauses two and three? If not, I'll put the question that clauses two and three stand as printed. Those for the question say aye. aye. Again, say no. I think the ayes have it. So we now move to clause four. The, uh, yes, sir. The Honourable Mr Hood. Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, uh, question on clause four, sir. Um, it's, Clause 448E uh, subsections 1 and 2 are particularly of interest to me, and I did outline them in my, um, uh, in my second reading contribution. And it really comes down to the issue of the, uh, the wording of uh, how a police officer is to engage the offence. And it says, I'll, I'll, um, uh, I'll quote from 
brackets one. It says a police officer may, if the police officer reasonably suspects that a person has engaged or is about to engage in prohibitive behaviour in a health access zone, direct the person to immediately leave the health access zone. Um, my, my question, I guess, to the mover or to whom it may be the minister, whomever uh, is the right person to reply, uh, is you know, th this is a, this is a difficult issue. H how is that police officer supposed to uh, reach a point of genuinely? Understanding that someone's about to do something. I mean, there, there may be times when that is appropriate, when you can judge that someone, it seems likely that someone's about to do something. But I guess the point I'm making is it, it's incredibly tenuous. Um, it really comes down to the individual ju judgment of that police officer, which may be perfect judgment or could be highly imperfect judgment. How, um, how does it sit with the, either the mover or the minister, or whoever's the person I'm asking this question to? Um, uh, that particular phrase and how do they see it holding up and being worked in practice? Ms. Franks. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, the um, Honourable Member, for the question. Um, the first thing I did mean to uh, add in my uh, summary comments is indeed we do um, entrust police with quite extraordinary powers and we do expect them to use their judgment. Um, we are certainly not. Uh, empowering them here to arrest somebody um, for the suspicion that they're about to engage. We give them the power to ask that person to move that person on and leave the area if they have that suspicion. It does not in it in and of itself, in and of itself, lead to a charge or arrest. What does lead to this offence coming into play is then that person refuses to comply with the direction of the police officer. And indeed, it is uh, a far less um, powerful uh, position than uh, though we charge police officers with every single weekend on Hindley Street, because we have declared public pre precincts in this state, where indeed the police officer doesn't even have to imagine that they're going to engage in a prohibited behaviour, but they have the ability to move them on, keep them out for days at a time and indeed uh, quite extensive uh, significant other powers uh, that we don't often afford people. And we do so because we've seen that that area is an area where the police need those extra powers. Now, this 150 metre safe access zone around abortion health care is, if the council supports it tonight, an area that we've believed that we trust the police to fulfil their duties, that significant power with that judgment that we anticipate they will have, but certainly should the police not exercise their authority appropriately, it would not stand up in a court. So that is the, the balance we make here in terms of protecting the workers and the patients and those who support them. Mr. Hood. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I thank the member for her response because I think that, that that is exactly the crux of the issue for me. I mean there is, I think I, mean, I don't want to put words in the honourable member's mouth, but I think she said that, um, uh, you know, in the case where, where it wasn't interpreted uh, or wasn't used appropriately, um, that you know it would be thrown out of court. But that, that suggests to me, and I'd like the member to respond if she is in agreement with this. Doesn't that therefore suggest that, you know, we acknowledge, or, or, or those supporting this at least, would acknowledge that clearly this is not absolutely crystal clear and that there is potential, as there may be in other circumstances, I agree with the Hindley Street example, it's a good example. It may well be true in those examples as well, but there is the possibility under these circumstances for it to be misused. And whatever the law that we make, that, that sits uncomfortably with me. I mean, uh, there's a, a high level of discretion, I guess, is the point I'm trying to make, in the individual police officer, who may well be uh, you know, antagonistic to these people at the site, for example, uh, for whatever reason. Uh, they may be completely uh, supportive of their view as well. That's entirely possible. But in the circumstance where they're antagonistic to that view, I think this interpretation creates a situation where, those, where, the, where that police officer has an inordinate, inordinate amount of power and potentially um, can create a situation where these individuals' liberties are infringed. That's the point I'm making. I wonder what the member would say to that. Uh, the honourable, uh, the honourable, uh, yeah, the honourable minister. Well, I'm happy to defer to the member, but the point, the point I'd make is to reiterate the point that the honourable member made, which was that this parliament continually gives police significantly discretionary powers 
whether it's, a, whether it's drug offences, whether it's the right to inspect a vehicle in relation to road traffic offences, we give police very significant dis discretions. They are not clear-cut and they are often challenged. Day after day after day, police have to account for themselves in the courts. That doesn't mean that the parliament does not give police powers where it's not clear-cut. We trust police to make their best efforts. We rely on the courts to curb them when they exceed. I believe that this is another example of an appropriate police discretion in a, a very important area of protecting both. And I, I commend the honourable member for continually referring to the rights of staff. I, I employ 44,000 uh, staff right around South Australia, and the staff of the Pregnancy Advisory Centre, like any other health healthcare staff, have the right to come to work without being intimidated by protesters. Uh, the honest Franks. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I just wish to add to that. There's a few things. One, we're not. Um, you know, implementing mandatory sentencing here. Uh, we're not having, uh, you know, that sort of an approach. And I do um, understand where the honourable member is coming from in terms of these significant powers that we do give to the police. And we give, we, we allow this policing by community consent. Um, but where you have concerns about how a police officer might uh, use their powers, um, the remedy there is not actually to give them the powers in the first place. It's to not have a police investigating police where there are complaints of wrongdoing and have independent complaints and uh, scrutiny on that process. And certainly that is a much bigger discussion than the one we are currently having. I'm going to move to the, for the amen amendment a further question, the Honourable Ms Griffin. Uh, thank you. I think I'm in order in regards to 48F, which is still part of Clause 4, so I'm in order. Thank you. Um, just to clarify, and look, I, I appreciate that we did have this conversation when we debated a similar bill, but just for the record. Um, for, for Section 48F uh, creates an offence to publish or distribute a recording. A person must not, without the consent of another person, publish or distribute a recording of a person approaching, entering or leaving protected premises if the recording contains information that's identifying, identifies or likely to identify, etc. Um, so I just wanted clarification from the honourable member uh, that if someone is uh, within the 150 metres, um, if they are filming themselves and someone else comes into that camera shot without uh, the first person's inclination or consent or whatever, uh, is it envisaged that that person could potentially be um, incurring, uh, be in breach of this provision, or is it the case uh, that they had no intention to record another person and therefore uh, they would not be in breach? Thomas Franks. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll note that the full title of 48F is Offence to Publish or Distribute Recording, not just to record, but to publish or distribute those recordings. And indeed, the person must not, without the consent of the other person, publish or distribute a recording of a person approaching, entering or leaving protected premises if that ident identifies the person or is likely to identify the person um, entering those protected purposes. So should a person be filmed and they know have no problem with being identified, there is no issue. Should they be filmed and have a problem with being identified, there is an issue. Now, we already have laws that are quite strict around uh, for example, you know, filming school children, uh, photo photo photograph photographing outside schoolyards or playgrounds and the like. Um, we do already have protections where we do respect people's privacy for many good reasons, not just child protection but for others as well. Um, you don't have the right to go and film people um, and invade their privacy uh, everywhere in this state. There are quite strict uh, laws around that through uh, various acts, but including the Surveillance Devices Act, and so it is simply a, a nice balance, I think, that respects the right of this person to that privacy and ensuring their dignity and their access to health care without the fear of it being splashed on a social media page to their stigma, shaming and humiliation. And indeed we do have humili humiliating and degrading um, filming laws for that very purpose as well, which were put up by the former Labor government. Uh, the Minister. 
Uh, could, I, could I reiterate the, honourable, the points the honourable member made? Uh, she made a number of references to privacy style legislation. We don't have strict privacy legislation in South Australia. But under the Health Care Act, we have very strict patient confidentiality provisions. And it would be completely incongruous to say that you could, you, you have to maintain people's confidentiality inside the door, but outside the door you can film and publish. Uh, I think this is a responsible provision. Scriven. Thank you. Well, I actually don't necessarily have a problem with this provision, but I do want to clarify uh, whether there are any unintended consequences. Um, so my, my thinking is, as far as I'm aware, and I'm happy, I'm happy to be corrected, that usually other laws around that refer to the purposes for which you are um, distributing or, or whatever, not to a, a particular area. Uh, I'm happy to be corrected if I'm mistaken in that. So my thinking is, opposite the um, abortion centre at Woodhill, for example, uh, there's a cafe, or I think it's a restaurant now. Uh, it has outside chairs. If you're sitting there, someone totally unrelated to abortion in any shape or form, um, you're, you're, you're having a selfie or you're having a, you know, you're filming a little video of you going out for your wedding anniversary, whatever it might be, and there are people approaching the clinic who may, and then you want to put that, you naturally put that on Facebook. Really? Really? Your, own, your own wedding anniversary. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No. Well, we're not having conversations across the chamber. I think it's not unusual for when people go out for an event to film themselves, either a video or a, um, uh, a photograph, um, and you, 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 you post that on, on social media. This is a, a, a public cafe. It has outside seating. So um, all I'm wanting to know is, has, are there unintended consequences of this? And I'm actually totally unrelated to abortion or the fact that it's um, uh, an abortion centre in that sense, in that this creates a zone, a geographical area, which, as, I'm, as I understand it, um, is, uh, is unusual in this kind of legislation. I say, I don't actually have a problem with this clause in terms of how it applies to people uh, who, not that we've had any evidence of it, uh, although we've asked for it, of deliberately you know, filming people who are going in for an abortion, even though we haven't seen that happen here. My question is nothing to do with that because I support that provision in, in the sense of not allowing that to happen. My question, which I think is a reasonable one, is are there unintended consequences if you're taking a selfie, having a photo, you put it on Facebook um, because you happen to be within that zone? You might accidentally get someone who is entering the, uh, the abortion clinic. I just want to know how that would be addressed. Hello, Ms Franks. Thank you, Chair. You may accidentally capture them um, and then it is an invasion of their privacy, and so this would account for that and would allow them to ask you to take that uh, down, for example, or give them some rights around their privacy if they're approaching, entering or leaving that protected premises. Now, your example um, through your chair, the example given of sitting in a cafe is not approaching, entering or leaving the protected premises. Hunter. To, um, to further tease out that hypothetical that's been raised, sir, if I'm taking a photograph of myself at a cafe <coughs> as a selfie and there's an abortion premise across the road 20 or 30 metres away, you're not going to be able to identify the stick figure that's in the background of the picture. And you won't be, therefore be captured by this clause because the person will not be identified. If, however, you sit there at the cafe with an extension lens on trying to capture those people, then you will be. That's the distinction. Uh, the Honourable Mr Scriven and then the Honourable Mr Pangello and then we are going to head towards the First yeah. Amendment. Yeah. Uh, look, certainly I hope that is the case as Mr Hunter has said. Um, however, I'm not sure that it necessarily is when you are outside, uh, on outside seating, uh, the, the width of a road and someone is approaching. So I'm not convinced of that but let's hope it doesn't occur. Well, Mr Pangello. Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. I, I just want to pick up something that the Health Minister uh, said in relation to breaching of privacy, uh, that if somebody actually came out uh, and it just so happened that their photograph had been taken or there was a camera there or whatever, that it would be a, um, a, an invasion of their privacy. Is that what you were saying, Health Minister? Under, under so health... Well, all I just wanted to say is, I mean, w what happened when you had TV cameras uh, and other people filming people coming out of COVID testing clinics without even seeking their consent. Would that have been a breach of their privacy? Uh, Minister. 
The, um, the legislation I was referring to was the Health Care Act, Section 93, Subsection 2, which says, a person engaged or formally engaged in connection with the operation of this Act, in other words, health care services, must not disclose personal information relating to a person obtained while so engaged, except to the extent that it may be authorised or required to disclose that information, and it goes on. The point I was making was this parliament has already, the honourable member made, made a number of comments in relation to privacy related legislation. I was making the point in relation to health care, we have some of the strictest legislation to say you shall not disclose personal information. Now, primarily that relates to the internal operations of health care services. But to me, it makes logical sense. If you can't identify a person receiving a health care service inside the door, why would we not? protect their privacy outside the door. Uh, Mr Pangelo. Thank you, Mr Chair. I just wanted some clarity on that, uh, Health Minister. Uh, not so much in, in this matter, but in relation to COVID testing, uh, where people's privacy would have been breached there. You would have been able to identify them. They would have seen themselves lined up, going in to have a, have a, have a test. So would that apply in that case, that section of the Act? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll call the Minister, but we, we've explored this one a great deal. I think we'll move on to the amendment yes, after so the Minister's I, I, response. I, I, I think the Chair is suggesting that I, sh I don't need to give account for the Health Care Act. The Honourable Member is bringing up a, another bill. So I'm going um, no, to call the Honourable Ms Scriven uh, with her amendment number one, Scriven one. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, in a letter to members of this place, uh, the Honourable Tammy Franks had a section entitled, um, How is a Health Access Zone Defined? Um, and she stated, and I quote, the health access zone begins at the perimeter of a premises where an abortion is being legally performed and applies to any public area located within a 150 metre radius. So the reason for this amendment is, is quite um, simple. I, as it's obviously clear to members, I don't agree that these exclusion zones are uh, necessary nor appropriate. However, if the bill does pass, I think it's entirely reasonable that, indeed, I'd say it's essential, uh, that it should be absolutely clear where these zones begin and end. Um, in the current... Oh, I move the amendment standing in my name, Scriven 1. Uh, amendment 1, Scriven 1. Thank you. Can I continue? continue. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, so uh, it's a fairly simple. Sorry, just trying to find the, the section. So it's a fairly simple uh, amendment, simply because uh, I think it's reasonable for people to have clarity. That clarity was provided by the member in a letter, uh, and therefore it pretty much replicates that. Except I think the, the word that we've used in the amendment is boundary rather than perimeter. Uh, the honourable Mr. Hunter. So I just want to reiterate, <clears throat> in relation to this amendment and all subsequent amendments. Uh, the, the comment I made <clears throat> in my second reading speech, without entering into the debate about the merits of the amendments, a successful amendment here tonight will have the effect, I believe, <clears throat> of sending this bill back down to the lower house to go through their processes of private members' legislation. And my fear is that it will disappear and we'll be back here next year with a brand new bill uh, trying to get this thing done all over again. So whilst there may be meritorious arguments about the amendments, I won't be supporting any of them. I want this bill passed as it came up from the lower house so we don't have to deal with this issue a third time next year. And if there are amendments that are so meritorious, then let them be introduced in a private member's amendment bill at a later stage. Uh, the Honourable Benaris. I'm about to sit down, but while I'm on my feet, um, oh. Mr Chair, um, can I just uh, echo the same sentiments that were expressed by the um, Honourable in Hunter? And agree that I think that there is merit to some of the amendment, well, to, particularly in relation to the review uh, provisions. Um, but it is not something that I think needs to be dealt with today, uh, and to hold up this debate. So um, I'm comfortable with the undertakings that have been given in term, by the Honourable Tammy Franks in terms of dealing with those separately to this piece of legislation. Mr. Cost. I'd, I'd like to echo the uh, comments made by the Honourable Ian Hunter and the Honourable Connie. F Benaris, I forgot your name for a minute. <laughs> um, certainly, I won't be supporting any of the amendments, as I indicated in my second reading speech. I think most of the amendments uh, have very little value or merit in terms of being considered in terms of this legislation, 
we need to pass this bill and start moving on. If there are particular issues that some of the members here want to pursue, I didn't know we had such civil libertarians, then I would suggest that they, uh, they pursue that at another time with their own bill. Ms. Groen. Thank you. Um, just for the record, though, maybe Mr Hunter can enlighten me. Under what circumstances would we be coming back next year with a different bill? Aren't we, are we intending to prorogue? Are we intending to pr prorogue? Well, well, well I'll, 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 I'll go to the, go to the, go to the Honourable Mr Hunter, because I think he's the one that possibly raised that matter. But, Fair, Mr Chairman. Uh, Mr. The Honourable Mr Hunter. We've, <coughs> many of us in this chamber have been in this situation before, <coughs> where we've pinned our hopes on a bill going down to the lower house, or coming up from the lower house, uh, and in uh, a, sp a spirit of compromise, adopted amendments which had to go back to the lower house once again, and because they have an amazingly arcane process down there, which I can't fathom or how they deal with private members' legislation, those bills disappear for all time and never get back up to the top of the notice paper to be dealt with again. And in that situation, if that happens, if the amendment is successful tonight, and uh, it may well be, depending on the will of the House, then my prediction is that's exactly what will happen with this bill, and someone in the lower house will have to once again, for a third time, construct a new bill to bring it back to our attention. I really don't want to see that happen. Well, the, the, uh, the Minister for Health uh, and very, Wellbeing. Very briefly, I think the other factor that might feed into the consideration of members is whether matters that are raised in the context of this bill might be more appropriately picked up in the termination and pregnancy bill tomorrow, e.g. the review, review provisions. If we have a review provision in that bill, uh, it doesn't need to be in this one. Uh, the Honourable Franks. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, I won't be supporting this amendment, and I note that uh, the, amend the bill that we have before us is something that is in accord accordance with the salary recommendations, but is also in accordance with the pieces of legislation interstate that have been tested in the High Court. So the language we have used in the bill that is before us being debated is language that has been used in those other jurisdictions. I am averse to straying from that language. Should we also not just send this bill off to the Bermuda Triangle of the other place, where legislation strangely disappears, never to be seen again, but indeed potentially should it even pass that particular test, it would open it up for another High Court challenge, or indeed um, difficulties around uh, where boundaries were not necessarily um, clear um, on these uh, properties on which the protected premises are situated. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sir, I will be supporting the amendment. Um, I look at the very simple amendment. This amendment really just seeks to define what the boundary is. Um, that, that is the thrust of this bill, to create an area around which, uh, the, uh, around which protest or uh, whatever it is can't, can't actually occur, uh, and to, to have that area clearly defined is, is actually very important, and, and I think this, uh, this amendment serves to clarify that. Um, I will protect. I don't accept the argument, sir, that... Um, look, well, let me start again. I, I do accept the argument that's been generally made that the other place has strange and convoluted um, uh, processes uh, by which private members' bills are passed. I accept that. It often uh, it never ceases to confound me. But I don't accept the argument, sir, that that's a good reason not to amend the bill before us. Our job as legislators is to make the best bill we can, surely. Um, we, we amend government bills all the time. We amend pri other private members' bills all the time. I don't see why this would be any different. Uh, and surely uh, my fellow legislators would like to see it being uh, the best bill it can be. I, I think this bill, uh, sorry, this amendment makes it crystal well, clearer what the boundaries should be, and for that reason, I think it's a worthwhile addition to the bill, which I disagree with, as, as I've outlined in my second reading speech. But nonetheless, this will improve it, and for that reason, sir, I'll support it. Uh, the honourable Franks. Chair, I just wish to um, note that uh, when the honourable Dennis Hood just made a contribution, he noted that this bill um, bans protest outside uh, health care services providing abortion, but indeed I draw his attention to 48C to B, uh, to avoid doubt, sorry, to, to avoid doubt, nothing in this part prevents a person from, and specifically B of that uh, section, engaging in lawful protest or otherwise engaging in lawful behaviour within a health access zone in relation to a matter other than abortion. 
my permission and no one has sought my permission, not in this, uh, this evening session, and so that and make that clear to anybody uh, that there is to be no filming unless, unless there's been an application to me, and I'm not aware of that. So there will be no filming from the gallery. Is there another contribution? If not, I'm. Oh, the Honourable Miss Scriven. Before the amendment is put, if I may, sir. Um, so, look, I admit I didn't go into much detail because I thought this was a fairly straightforward um, amendment, but it appears that I do need to go into a little bit more. So, at the moment, the wording is protected premises means any premises at which, at which abortions are lawfully performed. Now, the premises would often be interpreted by a layperson as being the building in which uh, abortions are performed, and someone could therefore rightfully think that they could um, uh, pray, pray or protest or whatever they might want to be doing 150 metres from the wall of the building. Um, I think that would be a uh, not unreasonable um, assumption, but my understanding is that the intent of this is that it should be from the perimeter or the boundary. Um, and whilst I realise that this means that anyone who is going to be um, engaging in behaviour at an abortion centre under this amendment will actually need to move further away. I think it's only reasonable that that is very clear uh, and that people have the, uh, the right to know. And the, the given that um, the Honourable Ms Franks actually included this in our, an explanatory paper, clearly there is some uh, doubt around it and so I think it's uh, worthy of being supported. I'm going to put the, the question, and the question is that the amendment uh, in the name of the Honourable Ms Scriven be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against say no. no. I think the noes have it. <coughs> the next amendment uh, is, uh, is, is also a clause for the amendment number one, chant one. The Honourable Dr Centavanti. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. I move the amendment number one, Chent one, standing in my name. Uh, look, I've made it clear in my earlier remarks why I feel I need to move this amendment standing in my name, so I won't speak at particular length on this amendment uh, except to say that this is an argument about the fundamentals of freedom of expression. I feel somewhat comforted uh, that the Honourable Tammy Franks has stated in her second reading speech, as well as tonight, that this bill does not prohibit silent prayer. Uh, and I'd hope that if the law is successful, or if this bill is successful in its current form, judiciary officers will come back to this debate to understand the intent of the legislation. However, based on the experience in the ACT, I don't think an assumption uh, can be made that silent prayer will not be deemed to be prohibited behaviour. Uh, and with that, I move the amendment standing in my name. Uh, no, Ms. Franks. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I thank the member for her um, explanation of where she's um, been motivated to um, move this amendment from. And indeed, I reiterate this bill does not prohibit silent prayer, even within that safe access zone. What it does uh, prohibit is those behaviours, those prohibited behaviours, and it ensures that uh, claiming uh, silent prayer as an alibi for enacting those behaviours is not given to people as a way to get around the law. Indeed, I haven't based this on the ACT. I have based it on the Victorian example, and I'm told there um, that there is silent prayer still around abortion health care, um, and that as long as it's not harassing, threatening and intimidating, uh, it is not seen as prohibited behaviour and responded to accordingly. Uh, Ms. Scriven. Uh, yes, and um, I'll be supporting this amendment. Um, I note that in the other place and also in the media, the Attorney-General stated that she does not think 
uh, does not consider that this bill bans silent prayer. So um, if the Attorney General doesn't think that and other members don't think that it bans silent prayer, it would seem to me that uh, making that clear by accepting this amendment would be the appropriate direction. I'm going to put the question. Oh, the Honourable Mr Hood. Mr Chairman, just very quickly, I, I indicate that I will also support the amendment, sir. Um, I think this is a, uh, you know, a, a very, very small bar. And in fact, it seems everyone is in agreement that uh, this bill won't uh, prohibit silent prayer. Well, in that case, I, I would argue, why on earth wouldn't we make that crystal clear for the courts who may have a different view or a particular judge who may have a particular view? As we all know, as legislators that have been doing this for some time, sometimes courts don't uh, take or pay particular attention to the Hansard. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Uh, and that is um, uh, you know, why I leave this. If we all feel, as I do, and I believe as the mover did, uh, a mover of the amendment does, that this is something that we shouldn't be prohibiting, uh, why on earth wouldn't we enshrine it in the bill, which looks like it will pass, uh, to be sure that that's the case? Um, so I'll certainly be supporting it. Um well, the Honourable Franks. Sorry, very, very briefly, Chair. I'll just note that again, this is legislation that has seen the tests of two High Court challenges. It does not prohibit silent prayer, but it does prohibit its use as an alibi to threaten, harass, and intimidate and impede somebody either working in these healthcare centres or seeking to access that healthcare. Uh, the Minister for Health and Wellbeing. On, on that point, I, my understanding from what the Honourable Member said that if silent prayer is conducted in a way which was intimidating or harassing, it, uh, it would be an offence under the Act, and to put this provision in would actually excuse intimidating and harassing behaviour. Uh, just, just one moment, the Honourable Frank. No. Sure. It, the Honourable Franks. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for the Minister for Health and Wellbeing for clarifying um, that concern that I think is, um, for those who aren't um, familiar with the, the history of this legislation, of how it's been tested, could be an assumption made um, uh, that there needs to be that exemption to protect that particular religious freedom. Um, but indeed, we are aware that uh, sometimes people, and you know, they may not even be religious, they may not be people of faith. Um, that they would potentially use this, for example, to have 20 or 30 uh, in a row uh, uh, blocking but praying uh, passage to that particular healthcare service. And so we don't want to open the door to allow that sort of behaviour. And indeed, I think it denigrates um, those people of faith to allow silent prayer to be used that way. Um, I'm certainly, as I mentioned in the second reading spe speech, I'm an agnostic person and I have actually studied comparative religion. I have an interest in some religions more than others. I did note, I think, in the second reading contribution that I'm not a monotheist. Um, but certainly this bill does not uh, prohibit people of faith from engaging in their faith, but it does prohibit that, for example, you know, 20 or 30 people uh, would be quite an intimidating uh, presence should they all be praying and chanting, for example, um, sorry, not chanting, praying, but you know, with visible, um, I think, uh, presence to that person who is, let's get back to this, this is a person who's made a very difficult decision. Often they may not um, have ever thought they'd be in that situation. When we access healthcare of any sort, it's, it certainly provokes anxiety in me, um, simply going in for knee surgery. <laughs> um, earlier this year provoked a lot of anxiety in me um, and I know that I was um, in need of you know, the most calming and supportive environment which I thanked the medical staff for providing me because the receptionist in particular um, calmed me down and gave me that sort of um, comfort and that's what we want people engaged and accessing a healthcare service to feel. They want, we want them to be relaxed, able to um, have their dignity preserved, have good access to that health care, and not to be put in a position where they're feeling shamed, stigmatised, anxious, stressed uh, in that situation. I think that's the, least, that's the least level of dignity that we can afford them. I'm going to put the question, and the question is that the amendment 
in the name of uh, Dr. Chintifa, Honourable Dr. Chintafati be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells. Those members supporting uh, the question should stand in their place. Those opposing it remain seated. I appoint the Honourable Dr Chentafanti as the teller for the eyes uh, and the Honourable Ms Franks teller for the nose. There being seven ayes and 14 noes, uh, the amendment passes in the negative. We now move to uh, amendment number one, Hood one, and clause four, page five, after line nine, nine, and I call the honourable Mr Hood. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, sir, I think this uh, amendment is self-evident. I move the amendment standing in my name, of course, uh, Hood one. Um, it really just requires a review of this actual bill and into an act should it pass uh, sometime after the second anniversary of it passing and before the third anniversary and to be laid on the table of the parliament six days uh, after it's received by the minister. It's pretty straightforward. I don't think it needs a lot of explanation. Can I, can I, one thing I would say, though, and so I, 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 um, Mr Hood would be helped with a, a much less level of conversation in the chamber. The Honourable Mr Hood. Well, thank you for your protection, uh, Mr Chairman. Um, that was quite intimidating there for a moment. But, uh, <laughs> um, but one, thing I would, one, thing, one thing I would say, sir, is that uh, this is not done in any skullduggery uh, sort of way. I understand the, 
um, you know, the comments that have been made to that effect. Um, I, I think this, this, this bill, should it become an act, genuinely reserve, deserves a review. It is, um, you know, it, it is very unusual. I think even uh, those that are supporting it would acknowledge that. I, I acknowledge the comments of the Honourable Ms Franks earlier in her um, summing up that um, she uh, you know, is somewhat supportive at, at some level, although d does, won't support it on this occasion because she doesn't want to see the bill returned to the lower house. I would say to her respectfully that, um, look, it, it seems to me that this bill will pass comfortably. Uh, it's not my choice, but that, that's, what, that's the will of the House. I suspect it's the same in, in the lower house. I don't think there'll be any problems. Uh, not, that, you know, not that that's my will, but that will be certainly the will of this place by the looks, and I expect the will of the other place. So what harm would a review do? I would say none. In fact, I think it's important that what are pretty extraordinary powers in the sense of, uh, that we've discussed about police sort of anticipating behaviour that contravenes the, the bill. Um, I would say is worthy of a review, and for that for that reason, sir, I, I move this amendment. Thomas Franks. Uh, thank you, Chair. And as I indicated, um, both in my second reading contribution and earlier on this evening, I do support a review, and I, su I support a review for many reasons. Um, I've, I think I've always supported reviews in legislation as they've come through, um, and a review may well find that indeed. Uh, there's ways that this law perhaps you know, could be more effective to protect workers and patients, or that it's, you know, um, some may believe that it would find that uh, police have been given uh, powers that are too great in this situation. But um, I am strongly supportive of a review. What I am not supportive of is sending this bill in an amended form to the other place, because a year and a month ago we did that and it never came back. The other place is indeed a little... The honourable member interjects, but I note that when you prorogue and you've reached second reading on a bill in one house, you can actually restore it to the notice paper, and we did that. And we tried again, and yet we could not get it to a debate. It languished at the bottom of the notice paper while people talked about car parks. For some reason, there was a great obsession with car parks in debates about abortion safe access zones. Goodness knows why, but it seemed to be flavour of the month every time we seek to get the legislation that passed this chamber debated in the other one. So a year and a month later, here we are, the Honourable, so the, the member for Hurdle Vale and I, working together, gave up on that previous bill because it did hit the Bermuda Triangle of the other place, the legislative Bermuda Triangle of private members' business that is conscience vote, not party vote, and deemed controversial because it deals particularly with women's bodies and reproductive rights. And we know the reality is that even with the smallest of amendments, the games that can be played in the other place mean that it will not come back to this place to then pass the parliament. There is an easy remedy, and I'm happy to bring a private member's bill forward tomorrow, have that sit on the notice paper uh, to effect a review. I imagine it would pass very quickly both uh, houses of this parliament, uh, should it have that support. And I imagine that games would not be played with it, because I think it would be of everyone's interest to have that review. Both the opponents of the bill and the supporters of the bill would probably come together. But taking a risk with this piece of legislation tonight and amending it and seeing the other House be able to stymie and impede debate yet again to play games behind the scenes to sink its chances of ever actually re reaching a vote in the other place, I'm not willing to take that risk. I'm not willing to further sacrifice those patients and those healthcare workers' protections that we could have afforded them a year ago, had the other place actually had the respect of this chamber to debate that bill that we passed a year and a month ago. Um, so in this case, I cannot support this particular amendment. Um, I possibly should have thought of a review clause myself. Um, we should have added that at the start, and I uh, acknowledge that that's something that we should have inserted in, but tomorrow we will debate that termination of pregnancy bill. We have every chance in that particular bill to put, a, put that review clause to look at this particular issue, or we can progress that private member's bill um, with great haste. 
Uh, oh, Mr. Honourable Mr. Pangello, you're going to be brief, aren't you? Because I'm about to put this question. Well, that, yes, and uh, I, actually, I, I also propose to move an amendment on the floor, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, look, I just want to make it clear that I, uh, I am supportive of this bill uh, that has come up uh, through the, um, the House of Assembly and into the Legislative Council, and I appreciate the passion that um, uh, both the Honourable Tammy Franks and uh, 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 the member for Hurdle Vale, Natalie Cook, have about this, um, and, and, and wanting it. We already have. Yep. An amendment that's been moved. Are you seeking to am to amend? Yes, I am. An amendment. Yes, I would like to move an amendment on the floor um, to uh, amend uh, the Honourable Dennis Hood's uh, amendment from two years to four years for a review. I think it's important that we do have a review in this bill, and uh, I know that. Uh, uh, there, there is these concerns that have been raised here tonight that they don't want to see it go back to the House of Assembly with a view that it may well uh, you know, be stored there. I don't hold that view because they had the majority numbers there and it came up and I'm sure it will come up now. I can't see them uh, objecting to having a review, particularly for four years. Now we know uh, with legislation that, um, uh, legislation that has good intent sometimes has unintended consequences, Mr Chairman, and uh, we've seen that with, with several bills. There are bills that uh, we've debated in this place that have resulted in unintended consequences and have others. Uh, I'm not going to go through any likely scenarios of those unintended consequences, but I think just having four years I think is acceptable. We can come back and have a look at it in case something has arisen in that period of time that perhaps warrants uh, a, a tweak to the legislation. That's not saying that the legislation um, you know, may not or won't pass. I'm just saying that it's fair that we, we do have a review, uh, just like we do with many other pieces of legislation. And we see this often in this place, where there's legislative table tennis that goes backwards and forwards with, with bills, and significant bills. And we will have significant bills coming up before the end of the year, uh, where there are going to be amendments that are going to be moved, and it will mean having to go back to the uh, House of Assembly, then having to come back here uh, before you know, they uh, uh, finally get passed back to the other place. So, uh, uh, with that, um, I wish to move that amendment uh, to the amendment of the Honourable Dennis Hood in my name, that, um, uh, yeah. that, that a review be conducted after four years. So, so just, just before I call any other member, just let me work. We were just trying to work out uh, your, your amendment off the floor. And so it would be in proposal two. two years yeah. to four years. Um, what the, uh, my great assistants here have proposed is that, that, that your amendment to the amendment would be in proposed subsection 2, leave out second but before the third and insert fourth. Four. Yes, Chairman. Okay. Now I've got, I had the Honourable Mr Ridgway, then I've, then I've got the Minister and then I've got the Honourable Ms Benaris. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll be very brief. I had indicated to the Honourable uh, Mr Hood that I was uh, in somewhat supportive of a review, and then in discussions with Honourable Mr Pangello, we talked about four years. I now have some, and I'm still committed to that, but I do have, uh, I put on the record that I think the best thing we can do tonight is to pass the bill as it is and then look at the private member's motion, or to, if, if it's possible, and I'm not sure whether it is, but tomorrow when we're dealing with the, the other bit of legislation, whether we can incorporate it. But I do have some sympathy. I've been here for probably nearly longer than every other than the Honourable Mr Lucas, and I've seen the Bermuda Triangle phenomenon before where things disappear. And, and I have always been um, somebody that's been a, a very uh, strong sort of advocate, even though 
I heard some text tonight about, am I really a right winger? Well, I've always been a strong advocate of being a pro-choice and it's a woman's choice to do whatever she chooses to do and not be impeded or harassed, even by the physical presence of somebody uh, at a clinic. So, Mr. Pre Mr Chairman, I'm happy to support a review, but I do apologise to Honourable Mr Hood and Mr Pangello because I did give them some indication earlier that I would support it, but I do think in the, the interests of making sure this legislation passes, I'd look at supporting a review uh, in, an, in another format. At, um, either as a private member's bill or in conjunction with tomorrow's bill. Right on, Mr. The Honourable Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I, I intend to be very brief. I, I hear no voice against a review in relation to this matter. Um, I, I stand with Mr Hunter, the Honourable Mr Hunter, in that how best do we deliver that review? I think it's best to um, consolidate the consensus between the two houses in relation to safe access zones tonight. I certainly would not be supporting a private member's bill to institute a review. I'm very attracted to a review in the, uh, the termination and pregnancy bill. This bill is part of a conversation, if you like, between the houses uh, on, these, on these very important issues. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, confident that through, those, through these two bills, uh, we will have both reform in relation to safe access zones and reform on termination and pregnancy, including a review. Uh, I support a review um, established through that second bill. Thank you, Chair. Can I just clarify? Um, yes, a private member's bill was the second best option. I, I strongly support amending the other piece of legislation that we're currently debating. I think that would be the most appropriate place for the review. And that is a five year review, however. Thank you, uh, Chair. The, the Minister for Health and Wellbeing uh, effectively took the words out of my mouth. Um, there is nothing on the face of it um, that prevents us from combining uh, the review of health access zones and um, the debate that we're going to be having tomorrow into the one. They effectively uh, and uh, directly and indirectly deal with the same issues, uh, and ordinarily we would uh, I'd anticipate that any review um, of the bill that we'll be debating tomorrow would um, involve a review of the health of the access zones as well. Um, so I think there's overwhelming support for a review. Uh, it's just where that review ought to be placed. Uh, the clear consensus seems, well, not consensus, sorry, the, the overwhelming view seems to be um, that it is best placed in tomorrow's debate uh, because we face less risk of this bill, um, complications with this bill. Well, I'm going. Oh, the Honourable Mr. Hood. As I'm the mover of the amendment that's being amended, sir, I'd just like to respond. Um, look, my strong preference is for my amendment. Um, I'm not sure that that will be carried. Uh, in that case, um, uh, the Honourable Mr. Pangella approached me just a few moments ago with, uh, with the idea of a four-year review. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to support that on that basis, support his amendment to my amendment, if you like. Um, I think this bill does need reviewed. I think two years would be a more, two to three years a more appropriate time frame, but I'm happy to accept four. So I'll support to my amendment. So the first question I'm going to put is that the amendment moved by the Honourable F. Pangello to the amendment moved by the Honourable D. G. E. Hood be agreed to? Is everybody clear of the amendment? And I'm going to put that question. So those for the question say aye. aye. Against say no. no. I think the no's have it. So, so the so the question now put is that the amendment moved by the Honourable Mr Hood be agreed to. Those for that question say aye. aye. Against say no. no. I think the noes have it. And we're going to ring schedule. Sorry. Is that clause four standards printed? Those for questions say aye. aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. No. And, and the question now is that this be the title of the bill. Those for the question say aye. aye. And say no, I think the ayes have it. I have to report that the uh, committee has considered the bill and agreed to the same without amendment. Uh, the Honourable Franks. Adopted. Is that right? 
I'll put that question. Those the questions say aye against saying no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, I need a minister. Uh, the Honourable Minister, Minister for Health and Wellbeing. I think I'm moving contingent to mo notice number one. And that's been seconded. Put the question. Those the questions say aye against say no. I think the ayes have it. And the Honourable Ms Franks. I move that the bill now be read a third time. And I'll put that question. Those the questions say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Health Care Act 2008. The question is that this bill do now pass. Those for that question say aye. aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Now, Minister.